And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming Cloudbreaker Alliance, which we'll be getting into al along with... So, along with this being a madman behind many um, tutorials for TTRPGs on his YouTube page, along with a whole lot of other things, the one and only CJ Lung. How are you doing today, man? I am doing great, yeah. Thanks for having me, Mildred. Yep. Well, today for you, tonight for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It's just the way things are down, down, down under. <laughs> um. I'm in Australia, when, by the way. If people are wondering, yeah, you're in you're you're in the part that actually has proper navigation when it comes to roads. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, we have too many roads to nowhere, pretty much. Well, the or the joke the next most dangerous animal. The joke that I had always heard was, Melbourne wants you to know exactly where you are and where you need to go. Sydney <laughs> right. just says fuck you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, but uh, it, I might be biased because the Melbournians hate Sydney ciders. Yeah. Well, I'm from Minnesota, and, and I'm I'm from Minnesota, and the and everybody in Minnesota hates everybody in Wisconsin. Everybody in Wis everybody in Minnesota and Wisconsin hates Illinois. Illinois hates everybody else. Just <laughs> the only thing that every state in the Midwest um, agrees on is that they will never agree on anything. Yeah, they are like our Shelbyville, pretty much. You know, mm -hmm. Australia loves their Simpson uh, references. Yeah, <laughs> I've <laughs> I've seen I've seen photos of the Simpsons references in those sh in those Shelbyville stores. <laughs> right. But I'd like to st I'd like to start at the humble beginnings. Walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. All right, cool. So yeah, actually, I've been. I started with Pathfinder, but the thing is, you know, um, I was you know, eyeing D and D, Dungeons and Dragons, all the other like uh, role playing games for a really long time. The problem is, you know, I, I didn't have because I used to live in other many parts of Southeast Asia. My family moved a lot, and you know, there is it is just impossible to get D twenty, the playing tools, and everything. I only started uh, playing tabletop RPGs uh, when I came to Australia, starting with Pathfinder, and then moving moving on to uh, fifth edition of D and D and Call of Cthulhu, uh, Doctor Who. I run like weekly organized group uh, like a while ago, and uh, I've also uh, taught a lot of people uh, to play tabletop RPGs, and also uh, became like tabletop instructor on PAX PAX Australia. Uh, three times, two times as part of the D and D organized play, and one time as part of the Call of Cthulhu uh, group, and uh, I also run a bit of the organized play of Call of Cthulhu, which was very short lived, which is quite a learning experience for me. So, uh, gives me some idea too, and uh, yeah, and now I am finally making my own tabletop RPG because you know this is uh, through years of uh, observing. Uh, player experience like uh, playing with old people young people uh, sometimes seeing uh, people that are really different like ex background in tabletop role playing playing on the same table it just brings me a lot of joy and uh, I do have a particular style of like tabletop a run of the way I run my tabletop which is why I created my game because you know I try to create more fun, more of a light-hearted sort of feel, and all the system is uh, that I've used and created for tabletop is to uh, enhance uh, my style of role play, and also uh, basically is to uh, allow the players to uh, pretty much have their fun, uh, to enhance their fun rather than uh, forcing people to play in a certain way. So there is a lot of like uh, behavioral economics and psychological stuff and pedagogical uh, elements that I put into my game design because uh, 
I previously I also worked as a uh, video educator at like uh, creating like uh, what's it called uh, videos that people watch at school if you see one of those cheesy videos that you just can't forget that you see at school mm -hmm. sometimes it is done uh, to piss you off to make you learn <laughs> there are some tricks to it but sometimes uh, they are just bad though <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So, so uh, mostly uh, yeah. So with the, with that in with that in mind, um, I know that I know that you had said your introduction was was on um, Pathfinder, but up up until rec up until recently with Cloudbreaker, did you jump around between a bunch of systems, or were you largely a one largely a one system guy? Um. Uh. Well, I jump a lot. Of system, another one that really impresses me is the Doctor Who role-playing game. Mm -hmm. Even though uh, we have quite a lot of Whovians in Australia, uh, in a lot of like Commonwealth countries, but uh, it is still not as big as uh, like D&D and Call of Cthulhu. Um, uh, relatively, I think uh, the D&D community is pretty big here uh, in Australia, but. Uh, in most Asian countries, uh, just nearby, around, uh, just near Australia, because at the Pacific, uh, Call of Cthulhu is tremendously popular, especially in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, even in China, and uh, what's it called? Uh, I think other parts of Southeast Asia too, maybe Thailand, if I'm not wrong. But you know, I think uh, D&D is also gaining a bit of ground. So I've also spoken to a lot of people from all different parts of the world. I think I did an interview series from people from all over the, uh, the world. I think in Poland, it's Warhammer Fantasy that was uh, really popular. And yeah, it's like different places have their uh, favorite sort of tabletop R RPGs. And uh, you know, I just think that, you know, um, and also in ev in every group of tabletop uh, brands, uh, they have their own culture. Uh, I have uh, friends who are really into Vampire the Masquerade. Mm -hmm. They have their own gaming culture. The Call of Cthulhu players have their own gaming culture. Pathfinder D&D, they have their own gaming culture. So I know, you know with Call of Cthulhu, we are pretty much creating a bit of a new gaming culture too. And as you know, uh, is like uh, pretty much uh, front and center in the setting of the world. It's more of a instead of a grim dark, it is light and bright. So uh, they know that you know uh, they are winning. We can do this. Mm -hmm. That sort of feel that we are trying to get. Yeah, I believe you refer to that as counter-apocalyptic, which is is definitely refreshing. Um, mm -hmm. I did. I I did. I did a piece not too long ago where I talked where I talked about how there's a couple there's a couple genres in story t in storytelling and in role playing games that I find have gotten a bit stagnant. Um, mm -hmm. Two of the, two of them in particular are cyberpunk and no, post apocalypse. And the large re the large reason I s I say that is. Inst is um so mit is so often it's do like if a, if somebody says that a game is doing a post apocalypse nine times out of ten it's zombies I think that's <laughs> the reason why the Genesis ended up standing out to me because it's not zombies it's mutants and it's more post post apocalypse because enough time has has passed from when the world turned to shit that new civilizations are starting to crop up mm. which I f I find um. I find particularly interesting than rather it being a few years after the bomb dropped. Like I've done, I've done the Mad Max stuff. I've done the Walking Dead stuff. I'm, I I've done my time with that. And same thing, same thing goes with um, Cyberpunk. Not if, I don't believe every Cyberpunk has to be doing the late stage capitalism corporate dystopia kind of thing. I think there's other. Ang I don't think that there's anything. That demands those that particular motif within the name cyberpunk, uh, and and the idea of it, the idea of a counter of a counter apocalypse. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose I suppose some may I, I suppose some may look at it as hope punk, but I th I think the I think that particular concept is swinging the pendulum too far the other way, mm -hmm. but. One of the th one of the things I one of the things I wanted to dive into is 
of all the dice systems you you went with, you you go with a two d six system. And when I think of pure, now I do I do want to ask one question: mm -hmm. Is this a case? Wh is this a case where any sync any time that you're ro that you're rolling die for it, for anything, you're using two d six? Practically all, uh, pretty much all, but sometimes there's a 1d6 uh, roll, uh, uh, but you know, most of the time it's 2d6 or uh, there is an edge, almost like the NDS advantage, you roll twice, pick the best result, um, but at any other time it's just 2d6, uh, because I don't think the abstraction of having any extra die is, uh, is useful. And besides, this is uh, part of the original game design that uh, you know, which has become the core. Because this comes also from my background of like uh, being like from many uh, parts of the world where uh, the, any of those fancy polyhedral dice don't exist. So in Southeast Asia, they don't have any of those. So that's why it took me such a long time until I get to play because uh, um, I was thinking of uh, also like people from rural Australia, from rural uh, United States or anywhere else, I want them to be able to play the game and uh, you know, uh, not worry about like finding the right die. And also, just to add a bit more complication, they can also use tokens. But mm -hmm. tokens is, uh, you know, you can just replace it with pebbles or anything you can find handy. Um, so the barrier to play, barrier to start, is needs to be very slow. Because I, uh, I was thinking of like my past self. I want to uh, make a game that that kid who is living in the middle of nowhere can also play. Uh, that's the first design choice I made. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and the big reason I a I asked is um one thing one thing that I always keep an eye out for is what I like to call the Rome effect. You know, but you know the whole phrase "all roads lead to Rome." Right. Yeah. Um, for for the last few decades, th the the idea of of um, different resolution mechanics for di for different situations has kind of phased out. That was largely an artifact of the wargaming scene. Um, it's still present in some forms, just not nearly as much. Most most games are going to have that one particular mechanic that everything else springs from. And this brings me to the other thing. In in your case, is it aim high or aim low? Aim high. It's always additional. Uh, it's fairly rare to have any like reduction, so it makes it easier. It just add. Mm -hmm. The so following up from that, what sort of effect are how how do you treat um, for lack of a bit for lack of a better term, box cars and snake eyes? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the box car is. Box car, <laughs> uh, but box cars is yeah. all, is all sixes. Snake eyes is oh, all ones. Right. Ah, oh, yes, snake eyes. I know. Um, well, uh, boss eye. Well, uh, that's you roll twelve, and then that's a crit. That's it. Uh, mm -hmm. You succeed, and uh, snake eyes would be a fumble. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. And we use one pretty much one roll resolution. So, um, you know, because we have an open book policy, uh, people can look at the monster stats and everything. Because I don't think that hiding monster stat is the abstraction that we need. Um, and you know, so that you know, when they roll to, to hit, uh, you know, two uh, d six plus their uh, attack bonus, um, you know, if they roll over, uh, equal to or over to their enemy's uh, defense, like if they roll the nine, so they deal one excess damage plus their weapons damage. So that's mm -hmm. one roll resolution, really quick. Yeah. Now. <clears throat> With the with that in mind, I, I will admit one thing that I definitely like looking at the skill list is that each skit that um you have a balanced amount of skills associated with each attribute, whereas some some games that I've seen clearly favor some attributes over others. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to be honest, uh, it's uh, the design is uh, specifically designed to be a bit modular. Whatever skill that you put uh, into it, it's mostly for role play and problem solving. Just to swing uh, on a vine across trees or whatever, um, it doesn't affect your combat. 
combat only uses mastery and the weapon because the idea is that you know if you are a really an expert like a uh, expert boxer for example you don't need to be a really big really strong so you can be fast or really precise with your attack that is just like uh, various ways for you to perform as well so uh, it's uh the strength or the agility you use is abstracted. It's just using your mastery and whatever the rug equipment that you use. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at the skills, uh, I think that is uh, not the whole picture because uh, every character only has two skills. And the rest of uh, the res uh, problem resolution uh, sort of uh, means they have is the toolkits. So everyone have uh, two skills, and uh, this is where the choice matters. You know, if you are a uh, so, so, uh, a soldier, for example, you can choose to bring more weapons, uh, more guns, uh, more like uh, more choices of shields or heavy weapons, and all that sort of stuff. It means, but it means that you have less room to carry uh, toolkits, to like climbing kits, which help you uh, swing across like. Uh, chasm and and or even like a, a mechanics kit that lets you repair stuff all that sort of things so um, this is where the choice of being more uh, versatile in combat or being more versatile in roleplay comes in um, you know this is something that you can adjust yourself in game mm -hmm. now when it comes to the class when it comes to the classes and dis and disciplines um, mm -hmm. One, I do find the the way that the way that it works very interesting because in, because um based on based on what I'm seeing would it be mm -hmm. would it be fair to say that put that um it's rel that it's relatively easy to to multi class within this system. Yep, it is uh, also part of the idea of the setting because. Uh, um, there are so many new people that you see. You you learn their technology and adapt their abilities, and just to improve your own, uh, uh, you know, uh, your effectiveness, pretty much. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that you know, in a, every class only have eight ranks. Uh, in the four first four ranks, you'll be able to get all the unique features. Five, six, and seven is to improve your existing features. So after four levels, at your fifth level. You can start multi-classing, you know, but you know some people are not very uh, good at learning new skills that quickly. So uh, we are leaving an option for them to stay in their class, so that you know they just improve their existing uh, uh, existing features. And after eight levels, I would assume that you know they should be quite familiar with the game, and uh, they can start multi-classing. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the fun of the game that you know, gets people uh, keep people awake at night is to uh, have uh, to have them think of all the class combinations they can have. For example, uh, what if I use a ninja berserker or a paladin uh, ninja or a gunslinger uh, dragon soul key blast? That uh, you know, uh, just imagine a cowboy that shoots key blast instead of uh, instead of uh, guns. Uh, Bullets with their guns. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do that sort of stuff because it is written uh, to be relatively loose. Uh, as a gunslinger, you can just mark a lot of uh, characters uh, uh, and uh, make a one range attack uh, to hit all of all of them with simultaneous attack. So it can be made with your arrows. It can make with your bullets. You know, like curving bullets, like uh, that movie wanted, mm -hmm. or even use your uh, key blast that curve your key blast. Yeah. Now. There's a, there are a, there are a lot of disciplines and a lot of and a lot of classes just in just in what's been mm -hmm. presented in the playtest. Right. So normally with these with this with these kind of things, I mm -hmm. would I would um I would go in I would go into them and and kind of get a feel for playstyle. But because of because of the fact that co that combination play is very is very clearly at the heart at the heart of things. I'm going to be taking a different approach here. So, what I would let, what I would, what I'm going to do is a bit of word association. Consider this like, consider this like a very, very weird version of a, of a Rorschach test. I'm going to, I'm going to go through 
the disciplines and the disciplines in class, the um, the, or just the disciplines, the classes will kind of we we can kind of add into it. And I'd like mm -hmm. you to give me an, a, a a character from a character from uh, from other types of fiction that could be considered analogous to it, a representative right. of of it, if you will. Mm -hmm. okay. So, we'll start with soldier, which has the peacekeeper and ranger classes. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, soldier, I would say um, Cloud, uh, Final Fantasy. Uh, they are good at uh, big weapons, or uh, just it's actually one of the more generic ones. You can all they can also be good with uh, guns and sort of like a cinder blast weapons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, what's the other one? Uh, Final Fantasy VIII. Uh, I forgot uh, that person's name. Squall. Um, that use gunblade. Oh yeah, Squall. Yeah, Squall with his uh, gunblade. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are really good you know, with. Uh, soldiers are really soldier classes. They are really good with uh, machine arms, so mm -hmm. they can hit somebody with a weapon and then uh, use a minor action to press the uh, cinder blast trigger and mm -hmm. to deal a secondary damage. Bang, bang. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Slash, bang. Yeah, uh, yeah, that sort of stuff. All right. Um, champion, which go which champion. is which has the classes Templar and Samurai. That's right. Uh, you can imagine them uh, more of a like a, a, a classic uh, Yusha class in most like JRPGs. Um, they can use a bit of a uh, magic, but uh, they're mostly a, a bit um, a tank. Mm -hmm. it, would it be with the difference between Templar and Samurai be whether you're going to be preferring to use offense or defense? Uh, no, no, it's more of a like. A, a, Accuracy or uh, what's it called uh, or additional damage. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, you know, since accuracy in this game uh, you can deal excess damage, they all balances out. If you uh, deal one big lump damage, increased accuracy just adds the additional percentage, which which will multiply if uh, you know if you deal one lump damage. But you know, for classes that deals multiple small hits, like uh, the uh, martial artist uh, based class like Dragon Soul or others, um, you benefit a lot more you know, from uh, the each additional hit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for example, if you, uh, for example, uh, you know, because of the 2d6 rolls, um, each attack, uh, just having one uh, bonus to your attack roll is can increase your damage by 10 to 15 percent. So if you deal like 40 damage, uh, uh, additional 15 percent just increases six damage. Uh, uh, 15 percent increase uh, about six damage, and you know, or even more due to the excess. And, and uh, you know, with the additional flat uh, two bonus damage. Uh, it's not really worth it, you know, for uh, characters that deal one big damage. Mm -hmm. There is a bit of distinction like that. All right, um, thaumaturgist, which which goes Thaumatur into healer and cultist. Yep, right. Well, uh, the idea is to have uh, pretty much a sort of like a cleric, uh, a bit, and a bit of a time mage. Um, so. The difference is that we don't have the time elements, but we have astral elements. Uh, they just imagine a teleporting cleric. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's possible, and um, uh, you know, it's just that you know their spells are usually more potent than Arcanists. But uh, what happens is that you know they are uh, they need more uh, attunement slots to attune to cosmic elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I because there is the when I when I look at the attu the attunement slot setup, I'm get I'm guessing that that w that when choosing when choosing a, a mat when choosing any sort of casting class, um, mm -hmm. the the your choice of attunement is going to t is going to determine your potential, for lack of a better term, spell list, and mm -hmm. nobody's going to be able to access all of the spells unless they re unless they spend a lot of t a lot of time with a lot of multi-classing mm, yep yep uh, something like that yeah 
Um, in one class uh, maximum, you have like four attunement slots, so eventually you will have to multi-class. Mm -hmm. And of, and of course, with co with cosmic magic, there the just that just having a beefier potential spell list means it's going to be a more focused affair. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep, that's right. So next is. Arcanist, which has the classes Spellweaver and Glamour Guard. Yep. So it's pretty much uh, Glamour Guard is pretty much your magical girl or any of that stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, Spellweaver is a uh, just a practically your basic spellcaster, your basic wizard with le the reduced headache of uh, not having to deal with like friendly fire. They can just like cast any spell they want, and they won't be able to uh, hurt their friend. Would you say it's more so analogous it's to be... wizard or sorcerer? Uh, wizard. All right. Uh, next would be martial artist, which is going which is going to lean heavily into my into my gimmick, <laughs> which goes right. into the classes um, dragon soul and tangling rose. Yep. All right. Uh, Dragon Soul is, well, uh, it's really, uh, by the name, it's very evocative. It's a uh, Dragon Ball. You should keep lost. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tangling Rose, uh, uh, just uh, a grappler that's mm -hmm. uh, with the misses you, you can just redirect the attack to the person you're grappling. Mm -hmm. And even the person attacking uh, the grappler too, because it's just, it's just like sometimes when you look at that bully, it's like, why are you punching yourself? Why are you punching yourself? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, although sometimes sometimes I have gotten creative when it comes to grappling rules and and taking mm -hmm. the approach of, okay, I'm go I'm gonna be doing a grappler focus, but I'm also gonna be doing improvised weapon focus. And mm -hmm. my GM was like, why? So I can hit a motherfucker with another motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much that's the idea. Oh, uh, that that he got real mad at me when I when I had managed to find a loophole so that so that if I wasn't trained in something, I could have anything as an improvised weapon, thus uh, uh, specifically improvised for thrown weapon attacks. Thus, some um, fl thus flying mooks became a thing. You know, grapple somebody mm -hmm. then use them as a ranged weapon. Mm -hmm. Right. If if Wolverine and Colossus can get away with it with a fastball special, why can't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. That's Especially the since the time that I did do a gra a grappling based character, I I went full luchador. Oh yeah, nice. Um the the old school the old school approach of no matter no matter what, as long as other people are seeing him, he never ever 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 took off the mask. <laughs> And even um, even tr even somebody touching the mask without his permission is enough to start a fight. And well, he would quite a bit. In fact, in fact, he keep he in fact he kept a book of the of all of the bars he was he is banned from because of starting because of starting fights. He looked at it as a badge of honor. Because I, because I wanted to be ridiculous. Then again, I'm always ridiculous. But that but <laughs> moot point. Yeah. But anyway. Um, next on the list is the Brute, which has the classes Berserker and Spartan. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, uh, yes, you're a 300th and you're a classic old Viking. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is, you know, uh, as the Brute, uh, they don't, uh, they are a bit of, of a tank, but you know, they don't heal that much, they don't do that much damage, but uh, they generate Spirit Point, which is a very important resource here. Mm -hmm. So they just like, uh, 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 Interpose themselves between enemies' attack, taking on the damage. As they take on the damage, they can uh, gain uh, spirit tokens, or uh, and you know if they uh, overflow, they can start like giving it to other players. Mm -hmm. So uh, they they don't just reduce damage; they also they also just uh, raise everybody's spirit up. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's sometimes fun uh, just watching your friend go like protecting, uh, watching the brute go protecting uh, their teammates, and then like just uh, keeping everybody's spirit up. Yeah, yeah oh. it's as a double use. Yeah. So next would be trickster, which has the classes rogue and bard. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yeah, uh, well, the trickster discipline has a special ability uh, which allows them to cancel the enemy's action, uh, which is really good if the enemy boss wants to unleash their special danger burst, like a special attack or something. Uh, they can just cancel it, but you know it's pretty much delaying it until the next turn, so you better think of something to, uh, to defend yourself with or quickly drop the boss. Mm-hmm. And bar, it's interesting to see bards here because bards tend to be a class with a class with a very checkered past. Most mm-hmm. mostly because of the fact that bards ha- have the until the diplomancer concept came along, bards were were kind of the, were kind of this third wheel problem because that because they didn't have that one thing that they were good at. Because mm-hmm. when it came, they're supposed to be good at support, but they're outclassed in that by clerics in the, in the in the past, and it wasn't until the diplomancer concept that people started to get the hint. Though I do, th- uh, though on one per- one particular bad habit I think people have with bards is the idea that they need to have a musical instrument. Oh uh, yeah, well, uh, Shakespeare uh, is not well known for his uh, songs. And if I have to use a video game example, consider um, Varric. Um, Varric mm-hmm. Tethras from Dr- from Dragon Age 2 and Inquisition. He is right. definitely a bard, but he doesn't use an instrument. He's just a professional liar. Right. Yeah, yeah. But the last one is Channeler, which has the classes mm-hmm. Phantasmancer and Talismancer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, this is your JoJo's Bizarre Adventure class. <clears throat> yep. uh, and also a bit of a Pokemon, because they control uh, spirits uh, to uh, combat for them. You know, uh, Talismancer is more of a uh, Pokemon-related class, and they do damage over time. So they can summon little critters just to uh, latch onto their enemies to deal uh, damage uh, consistently throughout rounds so in the long run they can be really effective mm-hmm. and Phantasmancer is um, more of a classic Jojo sort of like a stand user mm-hmm. um, I, I will I will throw a, I will throw a curveball and, and say based on what mm-hmm. I'm based on what you're telling me the mm-hmm. Talismancer is Raido Kuzunoha Mm, okay. I'm not familiar with that character. Um, he w- he had get. Is it <clears throat> from the Shin Megami Tensei something? Yeah, from the Devil Summoners um, side series of Mega Ten. Right. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't uh, played that game. Yeah, I, I am familiar with the other uh, other uh, other games of the series, but I miss the uh, that one. Yeah, I I just I just like give, I just like putting a putting a bit of a um a bit uh, a bit of a a bit of a monkey wrench into things. Um, now, one question that one question that I think is important to answer is: mm-hmm. Is it a case where you'd have where you'd have to pick a discipline and then pick the and then go with the two classes, or is it possible to have dis- is it possible to have classes from different? discipline starting out? Uh, classes from different disciplines starting out. Um, you start out you know, with having one class, so you just you have to pick one. Uh, also, the, uh, the levels, uh, the way the level is set up, it's a bit of a learning curve, it's pedagogical. Uh, so you start with one class, and you, know, you, uh, you can s- use your second class only when you reach uh, level five, so um, there is a bit of a soft, uh, soft sort of guard there. But you know, if you want to uh, le- get to level two and rank up your uh, another class, that's fine. But it's just that you know, it is not not encouraged. Mm-hmm. But but you know, if you're just following the rules, it is possible just to jump between the classes. Yeah, and I gives you option. I main I mainly bring that up cuz I I know inevitably with my table um somebody's going to want to be the gish. 
Oh, right. The, the... Well, actually, the uh, the Templars and Samurais, they can already cast spells, so they are pretty much Gish already. Mm -hmm. And... But one, one thing that I do... F one thing that I do find interesting is... Unless I'm... When it comes to when it comes to spell casting, um, I did I I have noticed the um, cyclic t the cyclic table of the of the spell lists. Mm -hmm. um, based on based on how based on how it's <coughs> how it's set how it's set up, I'm guessing that you that it is designed to encourage mixing around and not and not hyper focusing on one element. That's right. That's uh, the way it is designed. So um, it's quite easy to understand because uh, fire deals damage. Water is slippery. It uh, helps you escape attacks. Uh, wood is nurturing. Uh, it recovers uh, you know, hit points and also it just creates a bit of vegetation, makes it difficult uh, for enemy to move. Crowd control. Uh, wind uh, is uh, AOE. It deals uh, AOE and uh, Stone create uh, earth create barriers mm -hmm. and also earth walls and metal. Uh, just imagine metal detector and the scan various uh, utility stuff. So if you combine fire with wind, you create fire blast. And yeah. you if you create like a, a wood with wind, uh, you can create a ma mass healing effect. Uh, it's uh, supposed to be quite intuitive. The combination. Mm -hmm. Now. With that, with that in mind, <coughs> when it comes to spe when it comes to spell glyphs, which is a which is right which is right front and center on the on the character sheet along with barrier, are mm -hmm. the are those intended to be a way a way to a way to circumvent um, hit points and mind points being affected? That's right. Yep. And also, spell glyph has the effect of uh, using it to discount your uh, uh, some uh, some spells' cost. Uh, mostly damage dealing spells, so that you know uh, the wizards and uh, the other spell casters that uh, they don't uh, lose steam uh, after after a while. Uh, they can still deal uh, sort of a respectable amount of damage, so that you know they they don't become uh, dead weight after a while. Mm -hmm. It's just that you know they would have less actions. Uh, they they be, they become less versatile. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Now, yep. with that, one other thing that I was curious about that's on the character sheet is the concept of bond points. Mm -hmm. Um, and how how do, how does that work out? It's a bit of like a toolkit uh, for pretty much the uh, the game master. Uh, uh, currently, it's uh, very simple. By the end of a mission, you would gain bond with each of your friend, uh, each of your uh, uh, party members, and also the person, uh, your handler. Sometimes, uh, you know, at early levels, it's recommended to give uh, the party a handler, someone who will just uh, tell them, you know, how things are done a bit. Uh, they, obviously, the handler is not, sometimes it's not the most reliable. The party can just do things better their own way. Um, and also, they get, can gain bonds with a region. So if they, uh, it's more of a storytelling tool. After a while, if you gain enough bond with certain people, a certain region, uh, you know, they may choose you as their vice representative or even uh, deputy representative of that region. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, for each point that you gain, you gain like memory points. Memory points is a bit like hero points. So you can gain he uh, memory points by uh, visiting uh, locales, like uh, partaking in like uh, drinks or even like having local delicacies, so it encourages the player to role-play what their characters will do there. Uh, and also uh, pretty much helps uh, the game master come up you know, with uh, the world, uh, help them uh, populate the world with uh, various activities that the population would do. It would like, uh, create a sort of like a more of a living, living world. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bond point, uh, well, this is a bit of a, like a, a game master secret, uh, a secret option. And you know, usually at the end of their uh, 
uh, campaign, there would be a massive boss, right? Um, you know, if it's, you would be designing the boss to be super, super tough, and you know, they have the normal option of like sealing the ancient evil away for another like century or another hundred years or something. But you know, if they feel like they have to like destroy this evil once and for all, uh, they can uh, just get the uh, wishes of the people. So it's pretty much like Dragon Ball. Everyone uh, just giving them their blessing and uh, giving them a pool of spirit points coming from all the combined like bond points and divided by 10. And so, you know, because after a bit of a like journey, all these people you've met would like give you quite a lot of uh, uh, quite a lot of like bonds and quite a lot of friendship that you've created. So you would even with the division, you will still have tons of reservoir uh, spirit tokens that you can use uh, to defeat the enemy, mm -hmm. uh, defeat the impossibly strong, almost impossibly strong enemy. Yeah. Now, when it comes so to use that kit, sorry. Mm -hmm. When it comes to we when it comes to weaponry, um, mm -hmm. one you had already you had already mentioned machine machine arms, but there was mm -hmm. one. There was one other type of weapon that I saw when going through the classes that I was curious what that entailed, and that is spirit arms. Right. Yep. Uh, spirit arms are uh, weapons, uh, more uh, mundane sort of weapons that uh, you know you the type of weapons that need to come in contact with your flesh. Mm -hmm. So it's usually one lump weapon. Uh, it's uh, it's infused by spirit. Uh, there is a higher grade uh, called soul arms. Uh, it's infused by soul, which is banned. Uh, the soul craft is banned because somebody needs to die for that. Um, spirit arms is something that you can get uh, relatively easily, the normal ones. Um, because it's infused with spirit, you can also use it to hit uh, uh, ghosts, apparitions. Um, because some classes, you know, like if you're using mucking arms, you won't be able to hit ghosts or any uh, special uh, enemies that incorporeal. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, the thing, you know, there are some incorporeal enemies that attack your MP, your mind point. So what happens is that, you know, uh, the the game can be turned upside down. If you are fighting a lot of ghosts, the spellcasters can be the tank. And the the normal mili uh, sort of like physical class, because they won't have that much mind points, they have to like stay away from the ghosts. Especially the brutes, <laughs> they are um, they they have really low mental fortitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sort of thing. And something that something that I do f I do find interesting when it comes to the when it comes to the tags is mm -hmm. the f the fact that you don't that um unlike a lot of games that handle dual wielding you you haven't fallen into the trap of trying to, of what we call pay to not suck when it comes when it comes to dual wielding mm -hmm. because because so so often dual dual wielding is heavily penalized in, a, in to try and make it um, not too useful mm -hmm. whereas whereas in this case you just have it as a follow up that's a mi that's a minor action yeah, well, it's uh, well. There is still the action penalty, but yeah, you know, I think that's fair. Yeah, I'm just I'm just reminded of my days with like third edition and Pathfinder, where you had to take a bunch of feats just to be reasonably good at dual wielding, and that's going to mm -hmm. take several levels worth of work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I I don't think that's necessary. Just mm -hmm. make uh, dual wielding easier anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, mm -hmm. when it comes to the setting, you described it as Star Trek meets Final Fantasy, which, mm -hmm. when I hear that, I immediately think of Star Ocean. But, um, what? But um, what did you what did you draw from the Final Fantasy thing? A lot of people are going to be able to to figure out what was drawn from there. But the Star Trek elements, that part, I'm curious. 
All right, yeah, the Star Trek elements is uh, going around meeting new people, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as you can uh, see from a lot of the descriptions, some, uh, even from the Kickstarter, uh, humans are minority, newly discovered creature. So mostly you will be playing as orcs, elves, fornalians, and onis or angels and so on. Mm -hmm. So they'll be going out and meeting uh, new uh, creatures, new uh, life forms. And sometimes they can even like a cloud life life form or like the incorporeal life form and things like that. Uh, because, you know, um, uh, the problem with Star Trek sometimes is that everyone looks humanoid. <laughs> so that's, I think, you know, I, I want to uh, leave a bit more room uh, for people to create uh, like interesting uh, life forms to interact with. And also, um, uh, you know, uh, you can see that with some of the creatures here, they have been distorted from our usual expectations. Uh, the trolls, they love open air, they love the sun, mm -hmm. but you know, there is a folklore of, there is a sunshine troll, there is a lost tribe of sunshine trolls out there. Maybe they exist, but can there be trolls that are afraid of the sun? Uh, you know, that's that sort of stuff. And even the angels in yeah. Sanctum, in one of the regions there, they have horns because after the years of like uh, uh, intermixing with the Onis, they gain horns. And also uh, they don't have any physical wings anymore. Their wings become uh, light wings that's uh, projected from their back. Mm -hmm. So um, they ha there's the story of uh, you know, uh, a angels with feather wings that you know that was their origin maybe some feathered angel still exists somewhere that they can find that sort mm -hmm. of stuff yeah now with yeah, that and basically this uh, sorry uh, th this is uh, also uh, pretty much uh, influenced by my friends who live in japan and all and even like uh, some uh, my Japanese friend who goes to the West because they look at California rolls. Uh, what uh, California rolls uh, is a sushi invented in uh, somewhere in U U.S. or maybe Hawaii. Uh, they don't have any California rolls in Japan. And you know, in uh, for my like uh, Western friends in Japan, is they look at all the burgers, all the pasta. Why are they putting seaweed on the pasta? <laughs> so I think uh, this sort of like uh, interesting new discovery. Uh, is uh, is the sort of like experience I want to like uh, mm -hmm. uh, give to the players or something like that. Just find something similar but different. It's just uh, but you know, I know that uh, they some some of my like uh, Western friends they are they become really addicted to Japanese pasta for some reason. Uh, I just like I pasta. Period. Um, yeah, yeah. That's... I just like pasta. Period. And the there's there's one. There's one place that that I go. There's one restaurant that I go to, um, not far from where I am. That everybody else is getting sushi, and I'm getting this big ass bowl of udon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, maybe. And truth truth be told, not even I'm not even a fan of um of California rolls. Like I I look yeah. at that as I look at that as Babby as um Babby's first sushi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Though. Uh, it, yeah. And and you know it's also quite interesting. Look at the, all the uh, Japanese uh, made burgers, or and even like Moss Burger. It's like I don't know if that's a real burger, but I gotta try that. That's uh, that's the sort of like feeling. Uh, I remember people, I remember uh, seeing I remember seeing the black burgers at a Japanese Burger King. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, yeah. That's it, yeah. And pink burgers all that sort of stuff it's like i don't know what that is but i want to put it in my mouth <laughs> and as far as far as putting seaweed on pizza i'm i'm here going fight the real enemy the swedes put ba never... the swedes put bananas on pizza oh no yeah i thought you were going to say pineapple but yeah that's, that's no 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 i i have made i have made a truce with the with the pineapple on pizza degenerates <laughs> because because we can because we can both stand behind a common enemy and that is the Swedes who do banana and curry pizza. Oh, gee. okay. Oh my gosh. Uh, like, well, like I said, fight well, the real enemy. Yes, whatever float that boat, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, when it when it comes to that sort of thing, I I usually say, well, I'm in a free country and you are free to be wrong. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. That's the best policy here. Yeah. But 
one tr I w when it comes to the Titan arms, because of the fact that they're extra heavy weapons, would it be off base for me to say that they that they're akin to the weapons you would see in like Monster Hunter of just being ridiculously oversized? That's right. That's the idea. Yeah. <laughs> And the interesting bit is that you know they can also multi-class as ninjas and uh, assassins, uh, that is assassin disciplines. The idea uh, is actually not so far-fetched if you are familiar with ninja fiction, because mm -hmm. of the uh, Fuma Shuriken, uh, those are the giant uh, shurikens uh, mm -hmm. ninja use. It's a class. Uh, it doesn't exist historically, but you know, in the sixth, uh, sometime uh, in uh, I don't know when during the boom of ninja fiction in Japan, they added quite a lot of like fictional ninja stuff, mm -hmm. which are quite unwieldy, but it is uh, really cool. Yeah, and oh, when it and when it comes to when it comes to when it, whenever it comes to cert, to these sort of things, I'm all the philosophy I've always had is. Believability trumps realism. If you're not if you're not trying to do a historical fiction affair, that that idea of slavishly trying to be as realistic as possible is a is a losing game. Because the because um people who are people who are going to be at the table are going to be there to act to act out a to to act out the a particular story, and they're and a lot of them probably aren't going to have the same level of historical mastery that somebody who is aiming for that kind of realism will have. Mm. Um, it is... I let, I To use a video game example, I remember, be, I remember being told that the true race, that the true racing experience in video games is through Sims because of, because of having better physics than say, an, than say an F1 game. But you can't bo yeah. but you can't boil down t the only people who are gonna um, appreciate that are the point zero 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 one percent that is that of gamers that are going to have the full the full steering wheel and gear shift set which I don't which I don't <laughs> and yeah. you can't boil a game down to just physics because it's not just about the having realistic physics but trying to replicate the experience of being an F1 driver. Um, and the same thing the same thing can kind of can kind of apply. Is it uh, is something like a gunblade unrealistic? Yeah. Counterpoint, rule of cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. That's rule. Yeah, and I I dis I distinctly I distinctly remember built um I want. I wanted to do something ridiculous one, once, so I, so I had built. I had built a. Um, I had. I had. I had a. I had homebrewed a, a staff that was was e was equal parts grappling hook and a sunset cone. You know, a, a three section staff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Why? Because why? Because I thought I thought it'd be a cool idea. Or. Giving my pl giving my players overpowered but dangerous weapons like a crossbow that de that dealt sonic damage quite a bit, but it was equivalent to the noisy cricket from Men in Black. You fire the thing, it's going to do a lot of damage, and you're going to get sent flying twenty feet. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. The 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 whole the whole gag of somebody f of somebody firing an oversized weapon that just knock that just sends them flying after they fire it mm -hmm. like that's that sort of that sort of ridiculousness now one of one other one other thing i will i will no i will note that i find interesting is you cited discworld as yes, as one of yes. the influences and i've I've jokingly said that Discworld is the original crack fic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's well. Uh, Terry Pratchett is my uh, is my greatest inspiration uh, in all the work that I do. Mm -hmm. I have uh, pretty much read all his books, and you know I've got a really large shelf of all his books a while ago until uh, they are lost mm -hmm. because I have to move. 
Uh, and uh, but I still have a lot of his book uh, with me on my sh uh, shelf right now. So it's uh, you know it's an incredible sort of uh, uh, way of, of writing uh, likable and sometimes a bit of a bumbling uh, relatable characters. Mm -hmm. the, the thing uh, with the cloud breakers uh, the setting is that you know these people are trying their best <laughs> so they are they are not uh, the they are not like the federations of Star Trek where they have all the answers. They are just uh, half messing about, uh, making some mistakes, and also uh, crawling back up from their mistakes too. Mm. So uh, you are uh, together with these people, trying to sort things out. They may not have the best answers too, but at least they are trying, and uh, you know that's what you're trying to. Because uh, if it gets, if, if they know it all, it does get preachy and gets annoying. So uh, part of uh, what the players are doing is that you know they are also. Cre uh, creating the organization that they want to be in and also want to perhaps one day lead mm -hmm. um when you when you mentioned the whole mess making mistakes there's a there's a couple things that come to mind that would pro would probably make good um points of reference for that for that sort of thing um one of them was the original teaser for overstrike the game that would eventually become fuse which was disappointing <laughs> overstrike um, depicted an um, a a a almost GI Joe like like espionage organization, but the ca the cast that you'd be playing as are kind of the oddballs, the outcasts, the guys who are able to are able to do the job, but there te but there tends to be a bit of chaos in their wake. And <laughs> the other was um was Battlefield Bad Company. Where you have a group of soldiers who are the front lines of the front lines, largely because they're expendable and they are very, very dysfunctional. <laughs> yep, something like that. Yeah. Oh, but speaking of that, something that I find interesting with is the fact that you have grid combat in in the way in the way that I've seen it, but it's, it's not exactly. It's not exactly one. It's not exactly one square for one unit, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. In a roundabout way, it kind of reminds me of the hex system in Wild Arms Five. Mm. Oh, uh, I don't quite remember anymore. Uh, it's it's a really old game now. Uh, uh, well, the idea is to use a zone because you know, um, this is a bit of like. Uh, well, uh, in some uh, Japanese uh, RP uh, tabletop role-playing games, they also use zones. I think uh, Sword World use zones. Uh, yep. It's the idea is that you know if you want to move uh, from one place to another, I think that just counting the number of squares is doesn't have any narrative significance. So uh, I was thinking of you know um, moving from zone to zone. So that you know, if there is, for example, there's an obstacle between zones, or if the new zone has, uh, uh, you know, has a trap in it or any hazard in it, if there is a narrative significance in moving the zone into into the zone. So that you know, you don't uh, get too busy counting counting blocks. You just mm -hmm. know that you know, if I move, what will happen? Yeah, and that's a way of uh, framing the context of movement. Although the tricky thing with Sword World is that it has three different types of types of um, combat, right? Yeah, but <laughs> but even but it's still even good, still good. yeah, oh, it's it's de it's definitely good and something and with Sword World, it's a case where you you can't not multi-class in Sword World. Mm -hmm. You can you ha you have to. I suppose I suppose you could be just a just a straight just put all your experience points in just straight warrior, but you'd be putting a ball and chain around your neck doing that. Um. Oh. Now, one per one particular thing I'm uh, that I'm interested interested in, given the way you've described um, Cloudbreaker, is is would it be possible to run? Um, Cloudbreaker in a hex crawl style of play. Uh, yes, it should be possible. It's just that it takes a bit of like uh, getting your head around how many blocks you, you need to to move to uh, to move to a certain uh, position. But it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, it takes some getting used to, but yeah, it can be run like that. And I, I, I certainly, I certainly appreciate it. So, with all that, with all that said, um, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for the project? A page count. Mm-hmm. Or at, um, at, you mean, at least an at least an estimation of the page count for the core book. A page count. Oh, the page number for the book. Mm -hmm. uh, Three hundred sixty. All right. So that that's a bit of full circle. Ha. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, good one. <laughs> Three hundred sixty. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I think mean, Three hundred sixty is a really good number, and uh, because you know we have. Uh, pretty much uh, basically all the building blocks of the game. Uh, so we have uh, monsters in it, we have also hazards, uh, they are not all traps, um, and also various other things that, you know, um, a good list of things that they can learn to uh, play with and also uh, missions. Uh, because the idea is that, you know, um, sometimes, you know, it's really hard to start a game, you know, with just one book. Uh, some games need a player handbook, a monster book, or whatever. So we are making it uh, relatively easy enough to learn in just one book. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, and the way to run monsters is quite difficult for many games. We also have a course. It's like in, in this few missions, you will learn this, you will learn this and this, and then on the next mission, you will learn this and this and this. Um, I, I guess because of my experience working in education, I'm making sure that the players are uh, know how to play the uh, game uh, perfectly by the end of the book, by the end of uh, all the few missions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I can so, certainly yeah. I can certainly get behind that. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a not a date, but a approximation. Mm -hmm. Like approximation early January for the beta uh, 0 0.9 so that you know, everyone can have a look mm -hmm. and late February for uh, finalizing it for release and then uh, we will be uh, producing it uh, sending it to the manufacturers and by July we will send out uh, all the books including uh, all the bonuses mm -hmm. and I will. I will certainly be looking forward to seeing that. But with that, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Uh, and no, it's all my pleasure. It's a lot of fun talking to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really know your stuff here, so uh, I'm really glad that I can speak to someone who who's really not, not, who knows what I'm talking about. Sometimes I'm prattling in so many different things, and I have to explain it all the time. So uh, you, uh, con uh, conversing with you has been really smooth for me. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Years. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>